Hey guys, I want to do a video tonight on end times prophecy and specifically I want to look at it in light of the possibility that a thousand years has been added to our calendar. Like the videos that I've made over the past month looking at this where we speculate that there may have been a thousand years added to our calendar, the dark ages, the middle ages. The time period roughly between 500 and 1500 AD. What if that time period never existed? And what if those people and events within that time period either were fabrications or real events and real people that occurred in more contemporary eras? And so let's get into it this could be a long video i have some slides not as many as some of the other videos but i want to look at this because ultimately looking at this addition falsely of a thousand years to our calendar brings our timeline significantly down to where we're not almost two thousand years from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but we're about 1,000 years after his death, burial, and resurrection. And so I want to look at this in light of prophecy. And I've questioned whether to put this out, and I've thought a lot about this and prayed about it. I've been looking at this for months. But if you'll follow along with me, by the end of this video, we're going to have, I think, another eschatology viewpoint to consider. So let me reduce this and just go on some slides for a minute. But we're discussing end times prophecy. And we're doing this end time study based on the Dark Ages having not existed being a fabrication and i'll show you in a minute so that this is a standalone video how i came to that conclusion now i'm going to link the other three videos that has over two hours of information um, looking at this in detail that you can go and and watch either before this or afterwards just to get more understanding of it but what if the dark ages never existed how would that change how we view prophecy? And in my other videos, I believe the culprit is in Rome, in the Vatican, the papacy. And this fall of Rome in 476 AD Afterwards, there wasn't a thousand years of dark ages. There was simply a transition from the rule of Caesar to the rule of the papacy and a lot of spurious ongoings happened during that time right after it, which leads me to believe that the beast the fourth beast is doing whatever they can through the influence of spiritual wickedness in high places to distance us from the cross, distance us from the word of God, and possibly to catch us off guard on what's coming next. So I'm going to, I'm just going to briefly go over what we talked about in three videos and beginning in the 15th century, which I'm going to be looking at as not 1450 that the Gutenberg printing press was invented, but I'm looking at this without the dark ages and without this possibly false timeline. 
So I'm looking at Johann Gutenberg as being 450 years after Christ that he made the Gutenberg printing press. And, you know, after the death, burial, and resurrection, you had the apostles go out, um, spread the word of God, first throughout Jerusalem and then through all parts of the Mediterranean led by Paul, Paul's epistles and the gospels. And finally, on the Isle of Patmos, the book of Revelation was written. This all occurred in the first few decades after Christ. So over the next couple hundred years, you have persecution of the disciples of Jesus Christ, but you have a spreading of the word of God. You have true men of God, believers in Jesus Christ, who had scripture from the Antioch line, the pure line, and we're making copies after copies and distributing them in different languages. This goes over the course of the next 300 years. And by 500 AD, you have over 500 languages of the Bible in mass distribution. So you have the beast that hates that. And so, when the Gutenberg printing press came about and the Bible, and by the way, the first book ever to be printed on a Gutenberg printing press was the Bible, scribes no longer had to, had to write and copy. This could be done quickly and efficiently. And the Word of God got out just like today, where we have the internet and can do the same. At this same time, after the Gutenberg printing press and the Word of God is being distributed, the Catholic Church was trying to stop this from happening. They were trying to confiscate all these Bibles. They were trying to get people to bow down to Rome and their works-based religion, their pagan religion. That's when the Protestant Reformation occurred. And you see here the 95 Thesis nailed to the door by uh, Luther. And this began the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. But again, I'm looking at this from a timeline that the Protestant Reformation was a little over 500 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not 1,500 years, but 500 years. And during this time, the Bible is being copied into different not only different languages, but you have the English Bible being updated. You have the Wycliffe Bible. You have the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, leading up to the King James Bible, 1611. Again, I think it's 611, okay? So I think that this Protestant Reformation was going on, and during this Inquisition and this persecution, and these burning of these believers at the stake by the Catholic Church and their Bibles and their books, that the Word of God was still getting out. And all this was happening by the courage of great men of God. So the Catholic Church had to do something about it. So after the Protestant Reformation happened, the Counter-Reformation was well in effect. And this, um, you know, came about with the Council of Trent, which was actually three me meetings in the, um, what we know as the mid-16th century. But actually, I think it happened right during the Protestant Reformation, which was just a few hundred years after Christ. You had the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus Formation, 
and you had a lot of persecution, a lot of torture, a lot of Bibles burning. And not only that, you had any book that the Catholic Church wanted burned, they would take that book and then put the author on a list and take all of his books and burn them. And sometimes they took the author and burned him. A lot of persecution was going on. You see William Tyndale here in 1536 being executed for translating the Bible into English so that the common people could read it. And like I said, I found this slide very funny. It says, during the Dark Ages from 500 AD to 1500 AD, the Christian Church of Rome burned Bibles along with their owners. But <laughs> this period didn't happen. It was made up after they burned all the witnesses and the books that were printed during this time, during this era, so that they could rewrite history and that they wouldn't have any witnesses to tell us about it. And I want to show you how this all took place and how they tricked the common people into taking it with a grain of salt when suddenly the calendar was changed and a thousand years was added. Let's get into the details of how the history of a full planet was shifted, for example, with thousand years back in time. In the Middle Ages, people used to write years in a different way, not the way we write them now. There were two ways in the Middle Ages to write the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. One was Jesus and the other one was Christos. And when people meant that a certain event happened 300 years after Jesus Christ, they placed an I in front of the number of the year. An alternative version was to place the letter X and that originated from the name Christos because that is how till nowadays the Slavic people call our Savior Jesus Christ. For example, Ludovici and Sevira is considered by the mainstream historians to be a Renaissance publisher. However, as we can see on their own emblem, the year is 595. Before this year, we see the letter I and a dot after it. This is obviously not the number one. Another example, according to the mainstream history, this is 1521. However, if you pay attention, this is clearly the letter I. This is not the number one. And it's separated with dots. Another example, this is interpreted nowadays as year 1656, however we can see that it actually has the letter I instead of 1 and the year written is 656. There were different handwriting styles for writing the letter I. Here is another one from Germany. This is year 658. However, nowadays it is interpreted as 1658. So, the point of that video is to show that after Christ, men began to write the dating system based on the death of Christ. They use Anno Domini, A.D., the year of the Lord, and then would put the letter I for Isus. There was no J at that time, and I talked about that in other videos, and you might have seen towards the end. Some of those, what historians will say are ones, and the narrator were saying possibly I's, 
They also could have been J's because by then the letter J, the character J was, had been introduced to the English language and was used. Um, this was occurring in the 17th century when this transition between I's and J's. But early on, it was Isus, the letter I, so AD I 300 is not 1300. It's the year of the Lord Jesus 300. And so I hope you see what I'm saying there. But that's how some of the confusion, I think, comes about with the historians. But there were, like I said, a lot of documents, a lot of books, a lot of Bibles that were burned. And so we don't have those documents to see how those books were dated. And at the same time, I think as a sleight of hand, the Roman Catholic Church started to reintroduce Roman numerals for dating books and documents and things of that fashion to and then use the um use the m for a thousand and that was a way after gregorian calendar which i'm going to show you right now that was another way to confuse people when it came to the dating system and that leads me to the gregorian calendar and the gregorian calendar was introduced by Pope Gregory the 13th in 1582. I think it's 582. And that's how we're going to look at this on this timeline that we're looking at. The fall of Rome happened about a hundred years before this. The papacy in control, the Gutenberg printing press, got the Bibles, which were written by scribes and getting out to the people. The B system, the Roman Catholic Church, didn't want that. Inquisition started. At the same time, the Protestant Reformation began and a counter-reformation was established by the Catholic Church to counter this spreading of the gospel and the word of God. So, after the Council of Trent and meetings on what to do about it, in 1582, the calendar was changed. And we went from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. And it was said to make up a few days that had been missed over the centuries because of the way the Julian calendar was designed. But I think ultimately it was introduced so that the addition of time could be added to the calendar to distance us from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to try to take the gospel, the word of God, from us. And as we're going to speculate here in a minute, possibly to keep us asleep from what's to come. So I'm going to play one more quick video, and this will be it, but this kind of explains how the Gregorian calendar, after it being introduced in 1582, suddenly, after its adoption, confused people on what year it was. Actually, the common people didn't even understand what happened because, conveniently, exactly at that time, the calendar was changed. The new Gregorian calendar was introduced and everything was set to the so-called correct dates and because it was all done centrally on paper the common people on the street did not understand what's going on at all in this way the history the way you know it appeared it was not created by historians but by illusionists trickster circus style magicians however there were educated people as well and they figured out the scam. One of them is the famous physics Isaac Newton. Somehow they conveniently miss to tell us that he was a chronologist as well. He was persistently arguing that the history of the kingdoms of Egypt 
has been artificially sent to past with 1,800 years. The history of ancient Greece sent artificially back to the past with 534 years and the history of the Roman culture sent back in time artificially with about 1,000 years. So I hope you followed along what she was talking about with the Gregorian calendar and how the common people could have had a fast one played on them. And go back to my other videos to learn more about that. But just for sake of time, let's continue. Ultimately, after the Gregorian calendar was introduced in 1582, a few decades later, the King James Bible, King James Bible came about in 1611. Now again, I'm looking at this as the King James Bible written 611 years after Christ, not 1611 years. So again, there was no thousand years dark ages where nobody had the Word of God and the Catholic Church just kept it suppressed for a thousand years um, and nobody knew the gospel. At this point in time, the gospel was flourishing after the Protestant Reformation, not too long after the fall of Rome. And so, before we get into prophecy, I find this really interesting the, and goes along to prove my point about there was no thousand years. When, you know, we looked at, in those other videos, we looked at documents, books, coins, um, Bibles, like, like here. We looked at tombstone. We looked at all kinds of things looking at the dates. But here you see the Antioch stream of the pure Word of God, ultimately going through the Textus Receptus, but you see in 105 how it was translated into different languages up until 350. And then you see this thousand years just about where it says that there was an unknown number of foreign Bibles through the centuries. But that period didn't exist. You know, at 350 AD, then a little bit later, the Wycliffe Bible came about in the English language. And then from there went on to become the Tyndale, the Matthews, the Coverdale, the Great Bible, the Geneva, the Bishop's Bible, all the way up to the 1611 KJV. And so let's get to the point of this video. When Jesus was crucified, he said it was finished. And we know that there were many prophecies of this and that he is the true Messiah. He is the son of God who came to die for our sins and overcome death through his resurrection. That's why he is the way, the truth, the life. And he's the only way to eternal life and to the father, our heavenly father. So what would an antichrist and spirit of antichrist system try to do? Well, they want to add false religions and false gospels and take away the true word of God and distance the cross from the common people and distance his word from common people. But what if the B system not only had that in mind, but also was looking to the future? What if he was trying to put additional years within our timeline so that we would not pay attention to things that are going on when it comes to prophecy and when it comes to the world that we know it and what's going on. 
What if they were trying to hide Jesus' second coming? And the day of the Lord. We know that the day of the Lord was prophesied to be at hand. And the day of the Lord is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Not only his second coming, but also his first coming. And I'll show you that. And the time period between his first and second coming. And I'll show you that. But ultimately... In Revelation 20, when it talks about the millennial reign, what if this millennial reign was truly a thousand years? And what if it began at the time of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord? And what if it ends a thousand years later from that event? And what if a thousand years has been added to our timeline falsely and we're not in the year 2017 and 18, but roughly 1018. Remember, most historians will tell you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion, and then three days later, his resurrection occurred anywhere between AD 27 and AD 33. Just to look at a nice round number, 8030. If a thousand years has been added to our calendar, we're 12 years away from that. If the millennial reign is truly a thousand years. So let's look at the different millennial teachings. And this is going to be brief, but. Most people either look at a premillennial, a postmillennial, or an amillennial. And in the premillennial, that means that the thousand years has not occurred yet. And there will be a pre tribulation rapture premillennial viewpoint where people believe that. Believers are raptured before the tribulation, then the tribulation occurs, then Christ comes, his second coming, with his saints who have been raptured to begin the literal 1,000 year millennial reign. Then you have the other viewpoint, a post-tribulational viewpoint, and more recently, the post-trib pre-wrath pre-millennial viewpoint, where Believers go through a tribulation time, but not the wrath of God that we see in the seven trumpets and the seven vials. And after this end times judgment and the resurrection, then a literal thousand years millennial reign begins. Then you have the post-millennial view where... Things go on and on and on until eventually the gospel goes out. There's this golden age where there, everybody knows the gospel. And during this thousand times, there's this time of peace that is ushered in by the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then you have the amillennial viewpoint where you have a symbolic millennium. Because according to our timeline, a thousand years has already been passed, right? So from the time of the cross to now, most people will put, obviously, because that's what we've been taught, almost 2,000 years ago. So that's why there's an A in front of millennial, because it's not a literal thousand year reign but a spiritual time of the church between Jesus' first coming and his death on the cross and his second coming. And so you see here again, an amillennial viewpoint is 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ begins this timeline. And then you have the church age, or as this says, the gospel age, even though the gospel is everlasting and has been preached since the beginning of time, uh, the good news of Christ. But this is a spiritual millennium and not a literal millennium in this amillennial eschatology viewpoint. Again, here's another slide showing Christ's first coming and then the millennium, which is not literal according to the amillennial view. How can it be, right? I mean, we're almost 2,000 years since the cross. But are we truly 2,000 years? And if we're not, then... We have a new timeline where this could be a literal thousand year reign that we're in right now and that we're coming to the very end of. And so I want to look at, for the rest of this video, the amillennial viewpoint of eschatology, but not from a spiritual church age viewpoint but a literal thousand years. And I want to go over some of the things that are taught by a millennialism about the timing of Satan being bound, the present day kingdom, us reigning as saints and priests and kings right now as believers, and then the general judgment at the second coming of Christ. So I'm going to put this like this, and we have a lot to look at. So I think the best place to begin is in Revelation 20. And let's read Revelation 20 and the first few verses. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Time number one is mentioned. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set up a seal on him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. Number two. And after that, he must be loose a little season. I saw thrones and they that sat on them. And judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beach, beast, neither his image, neither had received mark upon their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Number three is mentioned. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Number four, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath no part in the first resurrection, that hath part in the first <laughs> resurrection. Um, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Number five. And when the thousand years are expired, number six, Satan shall be loosed of his prison and shall go to see, deceive the nations which are in the... Four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, together them um, unto battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And so let's just stop there and let's look at this. And sorry about the, the reading of this. I'm having problems um, pulling this up. But we're looking at a millennial reign mentioned in Revelation 20. And it's not just one time. And, you know, the amillennials will point out some verses in the Bible where a thousand years is used symbolically. Um, and, you know, and, and that's fine. You know, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but I always looked at this as, you know, it's mentioned six times. You know, the, the point's just being hammered over and over again of this thousand year reign. And 
so that's why I always tended to look at it as being literal and therefore tended to, you know, put my foot into the premillennial camp. But after studying and looking at this, you know, I can see the view of amillennialism. And then after looking at this change of times and law studies that we've been doing, now we're looking at it literally. And so it sort of joins the literal interpretation of the thousand year reign that premillennialists look at into an amillennial timeline. But instead of it being spiritualized, it's literal. So now, you know, there's a lot of things that we could look at in the amillennial timeline. It would take a, a lot of time to look about, you know, why the amillennial timeline looks at Satan being bound at the time of Christ and why they consider the church to be actively reigning as kings and priests on earth right now. Um, the first resurrection that we see in um, Revelation 20, you know, this is the first resurrection. Blessed are those that take part in that first resurrection. Well, that first resurrection is Jesus Christ. He's the first fruits. Um, and we are part of Christ through belief in him. We are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, you know, and so we are part of that first resurrection being crucified, dead and buried with Christ and rising with him from a spiritual standpoint. So we're waiting the second resurrection of our body to receive a spiritual body. Um, you know, and so looking at all those different things and we could we could look at that another time uh and i pulled up a lot of scripture about that but i think just for time's sake i want to just make a couple of final points on this now that we've sort of got this outline and i think probably the best thing to look at is the day of the lord and you know i looked at the day of the lord and how many times it's it's mentioned in the bible on the day of christ uh, and looked at those verses in context and let me just sort of show you what I found in Joel 2, you know, that is quoted by Peter, day of Pentecost, in Acts 2. It says in Joel 2, verse 27 uh, through 32, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days while I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So we obviously see the day of the Lord and those things which are yet to come, the second coming, uh, which are prophesied in the book of Revelation. But there's also a first day of the Lord where Jesus is born and comes into this world and begins his ministry and then dies on the cross for our sins and is buried and rose again the third day. That is the day of the Lord that Peter is using Joel 2 in context with. And so, you know, there's others in, in Joel 3, for instance, um, let's see, 314, or 13 and 14, put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down for the press is full. The fats overflow for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now this shows a lot of end times, the second coming um, being prophesied of here, uh, bringing us to um, the book of Revelation and Revelation 14, for instance, with the sickle um, being put in, the harvest being ripe. But you see, there is a day of the Lord on Jesus' first advent and also his second advent, 
We see this more in Zephaniah. In Zephaniah 1, 7 and 8, it says, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. And it shall come to pass in the day of, our Lord, of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. So this day of the Lord is speaking of the death of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, his once for all sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Uh, and that through that, the princes and the king's children and those with strange apparel, those who don't have the robe of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ are punished through that salvific event because they are not part of that salvific event. They're not part of the death, burial, and resurrection if they have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ, if they're coming to Christ with strange apparel. Um, and then we go on a little bit later in Zephaniah 1. So that's looking at the day of the Lord as Jesus' first coming. In Zephaniah 14 and 15 and 16, it says, The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. So this has a lot of imagery and symbolism of what we see in the book of Revelation before Jesus' second coming. So we see the day of the Lord, his first coming. We see the day of the Lord prophesied of his second coming. Um, you know, we even see the day of the Lord within the time period of his first and second coming. Um, if we go back to Zephaniah 1 and go to verse 12, it says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on the leaves that say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. And so... You know, at that point, the the gospel is going out to search those in the city of peace, looking for the city of peace with candles, with the light of the word, word of God, Jesus Christ. And if we continue in verse 3, 5, it says, The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Even every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. So here we see every morning in context with the day of the Lord that he brings his judgment to light through the gospel and that it fails not. His word fails not. And so we see again this time period between the first coming of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection known as the day of the Lord and the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is yet to come as being the day of the Lord. But now we see events in between that can be also considered the day of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 1.14, for instance, we see Paul say, As also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. So they're rejoice, rejoicing actively during this time period known as the day of the Lord Jesus. So, you no. Know, with all this said, the time period can be looked at of the day of the Lord as a thousand years, a millennial reign that is yet to happen that the second coming being yet to happen. So we have not reached that fulfillment of this thousand years. Um, and we see hints and prophecies in both the Old Testament and New Testament of this possibly being a fulfilling of prophecy. In Psalms 94, David writes, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So here... You know, we we see these images of exactly what uh, we see at the coming of the Lord uh, the second time when he comes back to judge the nations. We see this watch in the night 
this thousand years are but yesterday, you know, in his eyes, his death, burial, and resurrection, his coming back are a single day of the Lord. Um, in Second Peter 3, 8, where Peter is speaking of end times, he says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So this could literally be Peter prophesying of a literal millennial reign, the day of the Lord, from the time of his resurrection to his second coming, and that this amillennial viewpoint has it right in the sense of how it's laid out, but the only thing that is wrong with it is they spiritualize it because we've been led to believe that we live in 2018. When, like I said, going full circle, if the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, were a fabrication that was placed right in the middle of this thousand years at about the time it, between five and 600 AD is what I'm thinking, right after the fall of Rome and the Protestant Reformation. This is, a, we're about halfway home between the death of Jesus Christ and now during this timeline, that during this halfway point, the beast system came up and added time to distance people from the word of God and from the cross, trying to take away the good news, but also, in preparation for the future so that those as that day approaches people are asleep people are scoffing and not looking for the Lord and that's exactly what Peter says in 2nd Peter 3 um, so you know take all this you know, as a framework. I'm not saying this is literally true and I'm 100% positive. I think that it has some merit and enough so where I want to put it out there. And again, I want people to look at this more in scripture and in history. Um, when we study prophecy, we do have to evaluate history also. Um, you know, with the word of God to see these things that are coming, you know, Jesus has to watch. Um, and that's, you know, not only reading and receiving our daily bread, but seeing what's going on and, you know, use spirit and scripture to guide us into discernment, to guide us into knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the word of God, but also where we are in this timeline of end times, of these last days, that Jesus mentioned we are in these last days. Is it a thousand years? Literally, that's the question. And have we been lied to about our chronology? So I hope this was at the least interesting for you guys. I'd love to um, see you guys take it to the next level, shoot it down, add to it, um, I just want to help edify the body of Christ when it comes to prophecy and keep our eyes open. God bless.